Welcome to a Rice University digital media production. For more information about us, please visit our website at www.rice.edu. Welcome, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Susan McIntosh, Director of Ciencia. And it is my great pleasure to welcome you to this lecture in Ciencia's year-long series on failure, that rarely celebrated but essential pathway to improved understanding and performance. We explored in our first lecture how failures of visual perception led to an improved understanding of how vision is produced in the brain. In last week's panel on the BP Deepwater Horizon disaster, we heard how the presence of multiple fail-safe systems apparently produced a belief among platform workers that the risk of a blowout had been essentially reduced to zero, with the results that the signs of impending failure were noticed but not acted upon. The role of complacency in setting up the conditions for error and failure was underscored by our panel commentators last week who noted that checklists have proven an effective antidote to complacency by requiring a singular focus on otherwise routine and overly familiar tasks. The checklist approach has of course also been introduced to excellent effect in clinical medicine. Atul Gawande has been its most visible champion, explaining in his best-selling book, The Checklist Manifesto, you may have seen him on late night TV, he was everywhere, how well-designed checklists can reduce error and failure even for the most expert among us, including his own surgical team. Today's lecturer also explores the theme of medical experts and error reduction in clinical practice, but she applies the method of cognitive science to look at the kinds of reasoning that doctors employ to diagnose complex clinical problems and at their comparative rates of success or failure. Vimlal Patel is professor and co-director of the Center for Cognitive Informatics and Decision Making in the School of Biomedical Informatics at the University of Texas Health Science Center. Following her undergraduate training in biochemistry and microbiology at Otago University in New Zealand. She earned her PhD in educational and cognitive psychology from McGill University in Montreal. She came to Houston from Arizona State University where she was professor and vice chair of the Department of Biomedical Informatics and director of the Center for Decision Making and Cognition. Patel is recognized as a leader in applied cognitive science and biomedical informatics which provides a scientific foundation for models of decision making in healthcare and for biomedical education. An elected fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, the Academy of Social Sciences, and also of the American College of Medical Informatics, she was the recipient of the annual Swedish Woman of Science Award in 1999. She received an honorary Doctor of Science degree from the University of Victoria in 1998 in recognition of her contributions through cognitive studies in the domain of health informatics. Her research interests include competent performance in the workplace, team decision making, patient safety and medical errors, cognitive assessment of learning and instruction, including human computer interaction in healthcare domains. She has authored or co-authored over 300 articles in journals, conference proceedings, and books. She serves as associate edit editor for the Journal of Biomedical Informatics and is on the editorial board of three other health science and informatics journals. Her research is funded by the James S. McDonald Foundation, the Office of National Coordinators of Health Information Technology, the National Cancer Institute, the National Institute of Health, and the U.S. Army. We are very glad indeed to welcome Dr. Patel to Rice and to Ciencia, speaking on the topic of failure to detect medical error. Dr. Thank you. Patel. <laughs> Thanks, Susan. Let us 
is working. Thank you, Susan, for the wonderful introduction. It's somewhat scary to hear all that, you know? As you know, people who do a lot of things probably don't do everything well. <laughs> so it's really, um, it's really delightful to be here. Uh, I've only been uh, 10 months in Houston and uh, just starting to get to used to the environment and the place. Uh, and it's been a wonderful place and it's really great. And it's great to be here. It's my first talk at Rice University, so that's also really wonderful. Um, the study that parts I'm going to talk about today is a smaller part of a, a, a large study that's been funded by James S. McDonald Foundation, which is uh, based in uh, St. Louis, Missouri. And um, they fund uh, most, quite a lot of cognitive research. Originally, they are part of the McDonnell Douglas. And uh, more recently, they fund uh, cognition and cognitive neuroscience. And um, so this is the one of the very few studies they're funded in the medical domain. Um, and I'm going to uh, talk about a smaller part of a larger study that uh, focus on, but we can take a little bit more. Um, my background basically, as Susan described, comes out of the quite a lot in the cognitive and education psychology. Um, although um, I've always been appointed in School of Medicine, my primary appointment has always been until I sort of embraced biomedical informatics, um, which I'm still trying to understand. Uh, I've always been my primary appointment as professor of medicine and uh, co-appointed co and cross-appointed in psychology and education. So medical education and uh, instruction in med medicine has always been my baby and continues to be so. So, so the conventional notions of error management, it makes a real of intuitive sense that a person who makes a mistake, uh, then we usually try to blame that, that person, the last person on the chain, not who may be the, what, or who or what might be the cause of this problem. But it's a, usually we do that, and you know, we do that quite often. We sort of blame the person who's the last, who's the last person, individual as negligent person. And as you heard some often that we want a zero tolerance, we don't want any errors anyway, we want to eliminate them. How often you have heard that, so often it occurs in medicine, it even occurs more often than I would like to think. Um, and that particularly raises a red flag that can we really eliminate error? Can we really do that? Is it the last person in the chain who's really the responsible person? Although we, our behavior tells us that that's what we do. So, over the years, as I was, even before I was thinking about error, I've always been interested in how expertise develop, whether in other domains. Uh, for me, it's particularly been in medicine, but I have colleagues who talk about development of expertise in chess, in physics, in sports, uh, in arts and performance, and we compare notes just to say, what is the generic and the specific nature of medical expertise? How do people become experts at what they do? And when they make mistakes, when they have failures, what do they look like? Uh, when, do they make, when do they make such mistakes? Uh, and how do they correct them if they do? So over many years, that's where my study is basically uh, 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 focused on. So one of the things that we really believe that if you start with a first year student, no matter in any domain, and as they start to become an expert, they make their performance get better and better. I mean, they should. You know, we send a child to school, we expect them the next year to do a little better than they did the year before. We also expect them to less, make less mistakes, which is also quite a very intuitive way. We ask them to make less mistakes as they move along. However, data show that isn't exactly true, that people, um, there is a, a degradation in performance before it gets better. So you see it at a thing here, when I learned to maneuver this thing, oh, here it is. There's an intermediate level where the performance actually gets worse before it gets better. And this has been shown on many performance variables in medicine over the studies over the years I've done, and many other people have done as well. And then we show that it also occurs in many other domains. It's quite a generic phenomenon that happens, that it becomes worse because it picks up, 
And one of the major reasons seems to be in the knowledge-rich domain is that your ability to separate what is relevant from what is irrelevant is not as good and therefore it takes a while to develop. So you accumulate a lot of knowledge and it takes a while before you start to realize that all the information you have collected is quite a bit of junk as well as relevant and to be able to separate that out. And as you're developing expertise, you're developing a particular kind of schema for the domain. And the schema also helps you to separate out the irrelevant from relevant information. So I think this is what happens here. And it's been well known now and well documented. So, and what we call it an intermediate effect. So this was counterintuitive and I kind of, a lot of people challenged this over the years with me and felt that maybe there is a problem with my experimental paradigm, which is very understandable. That could be, and we repeated a lot of experiments to show that it wasn't true. And then Alan Newell at Carnegie Mellon told me once that he has this system, machine learning called SOAR, that also has an impasse after a while. I mean, the stims accumulate, it impasses. So hearing from him that it helps in machine learning as well, I felt a little, little better about it, that maybe it's not too much of an artifact. Um, and it's also presumed that generation of errors from novice to experts will go down, of course. As you develop expertise, your, expert, your errors will become less and less. You make less mistakes. But that appears not to be so, at least in the other domains. So what we are starting to find, and this isn't exactly, it's quite counterintuitive, isn't exactly <laughs> true. So there is this myth of uh, infallible expert, that experts do not make mistakes. Um, there is a public perception that you know, if you make a mistake, there is a malpractice, and the media always expects you to not to make mistakes. And so, or report all the mistakes they make, and no one is going to report it if you're going to have malpractice suit. And there's expectation that there can be flawless performance, and we all do. And there's also this personal, you know, uh, perception that the the error is associated with burnout and emotional distress and multitasking. Therefore, an, an expert should be over and above most of this. It's only when you're learning you have this, and this is a kind of uh, conventional wisdom that we are challenging currently. So in medicine, of course, this is the, in the British Medical Journal, uh, lots of quotes like this, a quest for zero defect, you know, that strangely there is no place for, uh, for mistakes in modern medicine. No. Technological wonders have in fact created an expectation of perfection, and it has. It's going to change everything. Patients have colluded with doctors to deny the existence of error. Hospitals react to every error as an anomaly for which the solution is ferret out and to blame the individual with the promise that it will never happen again. We hear that very often from hospitals. And this is kind of, for me, it just creates something knowing for 25 years I've been around in the hospitals and learning, doing my studies, really gives me a really lot of trouble thought about this, that it doesn't really going to be like that. So challenging convention recent is that there is a um, there's National Academy of Science um, books that came out that said it isn't about individual error. It's error is in a, in a system. It creates, could be due to environmental factors, could be due to many other factors that influence hospital guidelines. It could be due to your lack of sleep that you've had all night when you're trying to do your emotional status. Could be many things that can happen. So it's a more or less not an individual factor. It could be anything that can play a role at that moment in time. And of course, the other belief is that human error can be eliminated. You know, you can just, people say, how can we eliminate this? How can we get rid of it? Um, what we don't understand, there is a functional role of <coughs> error or failure. We've known that in a long time in psychological literature, how we learn from failure, learning is an important. Medicine has not embraced that as well. The failure is a learning thing. And in a learning mode, when you're le teaching in medical schools, uh, failure is acceptable. When you're practicing, it's not acceptable. But practice is a place sometime to learn when you're really learning in an environment. It's, it's a touchy topic because you don't, you don't want to make a mistake when you are um, when you're actually doing things. And if you think too much while you're doing things, uh, 
the, it um, uh, affects the utility of your performance. So professional schools become very different from s other schools because professional, you have to be competent, you have to deliver. At the same time, you have to be a scientific basis for it. At the same time, you learn. It's not trivial and it's not a simple distinction. So we expect them to learn three years of basic science or two years of base, solid basic science where we teach them causal information of a disease, X causes Y causes Z. Then we expect them to go into practice and have Z as an indicator of why something else happens. Completely a reversal of thought without any understanding. So this takes a long time. So this is not, and to understand that error recovery is a part of a cognitive work in an environment. So other studies have been done in this area, particularly that comes out of the European literature in aviation and in similar studies in the European transportation system, such as the TGV, the, the, the European uh, fast train goes across. And um, they also started initially by saying there should be no errors. We won't tolerate any errors. And the studies have shown that um, reducing the quantity of error with expertise, with preliminary training, no matter how much they train, there's absolutely no reduction. So that wasn't the, wasn't the way we had to go. And uh, then the similar studies in European transportation showed that actually experts and the high stress made a lot of mistakes, a lot of errors. But the ability to recover from errors it's not so much making them, but recover from them so fast that it's not easily visible to a human eye until you're really studying them carefully, analyzing them. So I thought at one point in time that I wonder if this is going to be true in medicine. We're going to take a look at it. So I'm going to walk through some of the pilot, series of pilot studies we are playing with, exploring to show that this actually might be true in medicine. And um, so this is the, uh, one of the ones that Rene Amalberti, who is a colleague of mine from Europe, and whose paper showed that this is a, uh, on uh, human error in aviation. And what it says here is that you have, um, um, this is um, under stress, and the error under high stress, very, very high stress, emotional stress as well. <clears throat> this is under busy condition and this is under low workload. And this is the error recovered under the same condition, and this is the incidents that happen by plane crash, etc. And as you can see, that here, that most, the error detection is not very high, not able to detect very high. And then here, the error recovery is also not very high. And Rene tells me that that's because you are focusing so much at the task at that moment in time that you really cannot focus on anything else around you. And, and because of that, the incidents are very high, so a high record of incidents. But we also know from medicine that errors become very high when there's absolutely, people are not busy at all. When you're really very busy and when you're not busy at all, it just goes under the radar. So both are kind of dangerous environments. But similar results seem to appear in the other area to show that recovery from error might be important. It might be just a natural part of your cognitive activity. They're not something to be eliminated. In fact, you can't eliminate them. <coughs> so. We had an idea, and this is a kind of idea that I wanted to um, uh, study. And one of the things is that how does an error progress in an environment? Uh, I mostly work in critical care, um, and particularly where it's a high time pressure, high velocity of patients. Uh, um, you have people uh, pretty seriously ill. So how does the error progress? So you come in, a patient comes in, you have a routine practice, you see the patient, and then you hit a boundary, and you say, my God, I nearly missed it. You know, I could have made a mistake. I think I could have made a mistake just here, I nearly missed it, but I didn't make a mistake. Then you hit another boundary, and you actually do miss it, and there is a death. So there are two major boundaries. One is recognizing that you nearly missed it, and the one is actually miss it. 
this is, there is a safe practice guidelines that you have to follow. And this is a violation of that safe practice guidelines. Somehow something got violated. What happened at that moment in time when you really missed it? Was it that you didn't sleep all night or you were called away to do something else? Uh, or you just didn't have enough knowledge, or you had the knowledge you couldn't bring to bear at that point in time. What pushed you towards that boundary of making error? This is what I wanted to look at. <clears throat> and were you able, and of course, if you are able to detect and correct it quickly, you'll never get to the next boundary. But if you weren't, you will get to that boundary. So this is the recovery period in a normal system ability to recover from error. In other words, not only identifying the error that you made, you almost made it, but you recover from it, saying, my God, I know, I know how to correct this. <clears throat> so I wanted to study in a, not only retrospective, in other words, analyzing when errors have already occurred, but actually proactively looking at how people in a naturalistic environment uh, make mistakes under what condition. So I'm going to talk about one part of it, um, just about the um, experts and uh, residents uh, and some students' ability to detect and correct errors. And there are many other parts as well, which we're not talking about today. <clears throat> so objective is to better understand the mechanism by which errors are detected and corrected, particularly in the critical care environment and to investigate the strategy for error management. You notice that I don't use error, the word error reduction, it's really error management, and, and risk assessment as a function of expertise. So <clears throat> this is a, basically the experimental paradigm. <clears throat> like a good um, trained person in, in laboratory-based experimentation. I wanted to do some controlled experimentation and with individual people, one expert, one resident, one student, very detailed experiments. And then moving towards the naturalistic environment really in the wild. So paper-based scenarios um, or in vitro experimentation to in situ really audio recording of people really act working 24 hours right around with a microphone around like I have. <clears throat> and then in between have a simulated rounds. So making every possible to see what are the constraints of the, each of the experimentation and what are we learning from each one because each of these uh, give us some information but don't give us something else. <clears throat> so we move through the whole extreme. So just going to give a very quick um, taste of the in vitro studies. In other words, uh, a very well controlled study in the laboratory. So this is a, a paper-based scenario. Paper-based really means a computer-based in a way. And we had attendings and residents. And what we did is we work, we work very closely with clinicians. Clinicians are our collaborators, in fact. So what we did, we de developed um, clinical cases. So we developed two cases. And, we, and they're based on the real cases in the hospital. And then we embedded arrows. Embedded errors that are likely to happen in this particular environment to keep it as ecologically valid as we possibly could, They're likely to happen. And then we so got them to sit in front of the computer and identify, look at the, read through the case, identify, uh, and actually didn't actually ask them to identify errors. We didn't even mention the word errors. We um, ask them to read through and think aloud as they're thinking through it. And uh, t they may take notes if they want to. They can answer the questions and then response by audio recorded. Now, they summarize the case one uh, as they have read from memory. They don't look back on it again. And then this is a particular resident who's supposed to be giving an evaluation of a particular patient. So your task here is to evaluate how is the resident, what does the resident's evaluation look like? Do you have any problem with it? Do you think it's okay? Would you have given that medication? Would you have managed that? So your evaluation of another resident, like you normally do in, in the hospital rounds. So this is what it looks like here. This is a, a suspected diverticulitis. And the patient is admitted. I'm just going to give you one example. Um, it was an IV fluid and no fluid by mouth and uh, started with third generation uh, uh, antibiotic. 
So in this case, it was an inappropriate antibiotic. And then the colonoscopy was performed showing inflammation of proximal sigmoid colon. And the colonoscopy was counterindicated in this patient. It should not have been done. And, and all of these have happened before someplace, somewhere in time. On, day, and, uh, on hospital day two, she worsens and takes into the OR op operating room and um, dense so on and so forth. And in this particular case, the urethral stent uh, not placed during surgery. And then the so on so particularly goes on. And what's here is that did a CT scan without a prior x-ray. X-ray is absolutely necessary in this case and was not done. And then finally, the last part basically says the patient was discharged and sent home. So in this particular case, there were, and they did not diagnose that there was a, a urethral injury in this particular case, and patient was sent home. The thing is, there were five errors in this case. And we had another case, there were three errors. And some of them are more serious than the others. We identified which were serious in terms of patient care. And some of them could be latent. One error could generate others over a period of time if given different conditions, different situations. There's much more detail on that. So this is basically, if you look at the complete figure on it, what it really shows is that just, just the, the percentage of subjects in error one that um, you have um, experts identified very, very quickly this particular error. Others did not as well. The residents did not as well. Error two, again, and so on. Error three was not identified by people at all. And uh, this was in case two, error one and error two. These two errors are quite serious. They didn't do so well. If you look at the percent, you got less than 25% here. But what's more alarming is that no error detected by more than 50% of subject regardless of expertise, which is worrisome. But also I expected more errors to be detected by experts as they expected in the European transportation system in the other area, and I didn't find that. So of course, you always come down to your experimental design. Is there something really wrong with what you did, or maybe something else that you need to look at? So we did a very detailed analysis on this further. Huh? And we also found that when errors were detected, that when they corrected it, the experts um, and the correction by experts and uh, uh, the residents, the corrected here and justi expert justified a lot more. There wasn't really that much more mean corrected by experts as they were by residents. So really didn't tell us very much here, but did tell you that they don't detect under conditions where we gave them uh, in the laboratory conditions. Although the laboratory was set up in the critical care environment, in an office, Everything was simulated in the way, but it wasn't really the time pressure, wasn't really the condition. So didn't really detect it as much. So lower than expected rate of detection and recovery across all levels, which wasn't expected. More patient care oriented detected the um, residents. In other words, residents detected errors that were more related to immediate patient care. It seemed that if you are really taking care of patient all the time, you are highly tuned to the patient-oriented care um, errors. And uh, when you are not, you're most likely not. Therefore, ex residents that you detected the patient care errors much faster. And the expert did um, detect and recover more than others, certainly did. I mean, there was a general trend towards it. but. Condition was still too artificial. So we decided, let's move towards something like in vivo. Let's create another environment. So what we had done here is simulate an environment where it said, you are, uh, so that here is the, um, the attending physician in the medical rounds in front of the patient is in the room, attending stands out there and say, as every, every morning rounds they do, and said, I want to discuss a case today, and uh, I want you to evaluate for me, like they do any other case. So it was kind of, nobody knew it was a simulated case, nobody knew it wasn't part of the case, so environment was really as it should be. We had people, uh, um, 
Suchita Batwara, who's a physician and also a fellow in our department, and Sahiti Mainani, who's an engineer as well as a, a, a fellow in our department. They all collected this data by uh, being around with uh, audio recorders, as well as the physician colleagues who had the audio recording. So then there was a discussion. So what we really found here, what was happening was that there was a dialogue. Because there was a team, and the team was starting to discuss things, and we found that teams actually helped track the diet errors. They actually learned from each other as we were moving forward. Very interesting thing happened. So we found, first of all, that knowledge-based errors were detected, much percentage of knowledge was detected very fast. Procedural errors were not, because they, they really are in the discussion mode, we're most often knowledge-based. The other thing very interesting is that <coughs> The residents here were considered the experts because they were not attending. They did dis dis uh, detect and correct more errors than the fellows or the interns. Um, but much more interesting is that if you look at it here uh, in vivo, the, what we did was we took the dialogue, we did a transcript, and we broke them into many episodes, cycles of interaction. And we found that in the case one, there were four um, interaction episodes, and 66% of the errors were detected. And um, in second round, second times we did the study, we had eight interaction episodes, we had 100% error detection. The more episodes we had, the more detection, the more detection there was. Case two, we had similarly five and 80%, and we are 60% with one episode. What it really said that more the dialogue went on, more they are learning from each other, more they were interacting, and more they were checking it. Uh, so that part of the healthcare where teams get together to discuss a case, provides a learning opportunity from failure where performance in real time does not allow you as much to do. So in a professional school, when performance-based competence is necessary, this allows you as a way to deal with, with some of these, these kinds of factors that you can tap. This is a kind of just give you one quick scenario that error detection through dialogue. A person recognizes one, second person picks up another, uh, another particular important piece of information. A third person picks up from here and they start a dialogue and so on and so forth and they arrive and identify two errors very fast. <clears throat> what it really shows is that and detailed dialogue can help. We are still analyzing this data in a little detail, but it, this appears to be the normal trend. So summary is that um, higher detection recovery from knowledge-based errors and team uh, collaboration for failure management um, in the real world, you're working very reflexively. You're really sort of generating an automatic way. It doesn't give you time to reflect. And if you reflect too much, it interferes with your utility. So you want to, this gives you a place to reflect a little bit more and then feed back into the cycle when it goes. So again, the thing is, is this still too artificial condition? Uh, when you're really working in an environment, something different. So the third mode. So I decided that I had to really do this to just for, to see even if I did one subject is to see where we're going. And so what we did is um, backtrack a little. <clears throat> so this was, um, what I did was I took one expert in the intensive care unit, in the cardiothoracic unit. I followed him for 10 hour period. Then we followed uh, a resident and a student, 10 hour period analysis, in a real trauma setting as it was happening, really live, and, and, and did a transcript of all that, very detailed transcript. So what we found is that, if we notice here, that the expert within 10 hour period detected 18 errors, recovered from 15. Resident detected 13, uh, recovered from, from that eight. Student eight and recovered two. So finally a medical student. Um, so that was starting to become more like what we are seeing in, in the other domains. So closer to it, at least. Uh, of course, it's one subject in detail. 
Um, one thing it did say is that expert detected more frequently and, and recovered much more fast, much faster. A resident detected less errors and did not recover as fast, and students even less. Now, <clears throat> how do you know it's, it's, it's happening? So this is an example of how things, what do you mean by error detection? The question is, are there really errors? Or are they really you are negotiating with a highly dynamic environment in intensive care unit when you have to make moment to moment decisions so fast that it's really the dynamic activity of the workplace. It's not really a mistake. However, when someone goes down in, in the area to count errors, they will actually count that as a mistake. So see, there is a big problem here when people start counting the outcome. Oh, this patient is not, it's really, you know, the, so suddenly you see that he's given something else that should not have been given, went in a serious coma. But that is done so fast, it's not an error. So for example, in this case, the patient has um, a ventilator patient. And uh, through the and then what happens is that so the open airway is no longer protected and you have a risk of respiratory infection. So uh, then the risk of stress ulcers, you you don't give antacid these days, but they give you any other medication here. And then the stomach acid base balance just sort of changes. And then very quickly you give um, um, that the gram-negative bacteria proliferates in the stomach and the patient has to be, uh, they aspirate the patient for bacteria. And the patient gets pneumonia. And then, then you give patient antibiotic to treat for pneumonia, suddenly gets change in the gut flora. And then you sort of give something else, they get diarrhea and then the fluid loss, you get once again, fluid, you get extra fluid, you get electrolyte imbalance, it goes on. And situations like that, when you make quick decisions, you give them something, you're titrating actually, you're actually watching very carefully, changes in a litmus paper test, very, very fine tuning. So it's not really errors, and yet, when we do outcome studies, that's where they count as errors. So an example of an error generation and correction as a part of cognitive activities, that during rounds, a nurse has an urgent problem in a round with a patient. A physician is just giving the medical round outside. A nurse calls out, says, um, goes to the room and attending tries to address the problem, say, need help. He explores several possible avenues to resolve the problem until he finally determines the actual source. So this is the kind of dialogue. So initially, there is an error generation and correction. So the nurse number, number 10, or one of the nurses says, I need attention in the room, uh, to calls out to nurse three, and nurse three says, I'm looking after him, another patient. And uh, fellow says, what do you need? The another nurse says, um, I need albumin. Um, see what I'm about to turn him to, whatever. And the attending notices, the A line is not working quickly recognizes. And then um, uh, they continue a whole lot of dialogue and they you know, said that, you know, so what are the flaws the, the fellow calls out? The nurse says, the first thing I looked just before I turned off the aramine, it was 138. I put it down to two drops, uh, then I turn it off. And attending says, well, put the aramine back. Why did you turn it off? Uh, nurse 10 says, pressure um, 138. Uh, then why wean the patient? Why, um, why don't you, um, you don't want the aramine? So dialogue continues as you go, that people identifying certain, it's happening very, very fast, by the way. And uh, then they continue, they recognize that um, as they keep on doing it, there are more and more errors they keep recognizing, correcting, recognizing, correcting, very fast as a team. And experts recognize a lot of them. This is the kind of coding we did for 10 hours of protocol for each, just to see, just to get a feel, that are, we, are we in the right direction? Is it likely that we are going to find things like in other areas, or are we going to be completely different? So this is what we are looking at. Uh, so attending exactly the same thing uh, finds more problems as they're moving forward. Um, then in the intensive care, your resident helps the nurse. Then there is another one. This is the attending, finding many errors, correcting it very fast in the working environment. But then there is also this ability to correct errors by interaction, as we saw in the medical rounds. So here. An, an ICU resident helps a nurse move a patient uh, with the endotracheal tube. 
And uh, upon doing so, the resident changes the flow of oxygen uh, setting in the ventilator to 100%. The nurse doesn't notice it, and, and it happens. And when handling the patient to another nurse, they together discover the setting was changed. They go on discovering, this is a whole dialogue that goes on, and uh, says, you know, I see his numbers don't really show up, and all is wet. What basically this dialogue says is that the lab data didn't match what the patient looked like. The patient's condition didn't look good, but the lab values looked, it, you know, looked pretty good. So it didn't really match completely. So what had really happened here was that that the dial had been changed by mistake and they noticed it. Dialogue keeps on happening here until to the end. They keeps on going right at the end when they say, you know, oh, you have it at 100%. That's why you're not seeing it. That's why. Who changed it? No. And they'll say, well, you did, when you did the vent, you changed it. It identifying. And there are many of these things subtle happening, but they happen very quickly and they're not really considered as an error. They're considered as something that you sometimes do very, very fast. It happens, but your ability to detect. So when you correct it, make a mistake yourself and correct it yourself, you're really thinking about your own thought. It's what you call a metacognition. You're really thinking about, but when you are correcting someone else's error, that's something different, that you actually have a tune of your shared knowledge that you're correcting an intimate interaction. So basically what it really says is that mistakes will happen and failures Failure will occur, failure, failures will happen, no question about it. You're not going to have a zero tolerance anywhere. And, but the understanding is, what are the boundaries? If I make mistake doing, in my work environment every day, what are most likely boundaries of my errors? What are the nature of errors I'm likely to make? And if I'm, if I, somebody tells me you can't make that mistake, and if I really make them all the time, most likely I'll find a way to get around it. It's just the way human beings are. Um, and if you know, understand the boundaries of errors and train them to be resilient, and if you're building system to support people, they have to be resilient system which take into account the human resiliency. And, and also to understand that we are not just the people who make mistakes. We are actually an error check. We have a cognitive ability to check our errors, able to evaluate our errors. And we are also a safety check, a safety mechanism. Therefore, investing money in hard technology that is going to support us without investing in human mind, I don't believe is the right way to go. And I think training human mind understanding is really provides the kind of extra thing. Well, to understand them as more and more technological support is being given, uh, more and more um, we need to understand the training of, of um, medical personnel or any professional personnel for that matter requires higher level thinking judgment call. We're asking them a judgment call. Lower level things to be taken over by by um, uh, technology, but the higher level skill was still required for a judgment call, ability to uh, manage failures very quickly and learn from them uh, on the job. And, and this is going to require something much more than just putting in technology in place. And putting resources can be very, very important. So I think this is where we are at right now in, in thing. So now uh, the studies that are concurrently doing is when this expert or this people, this expert uh, um, and the novices and the rest of the team who are working in the clinical environment, what happens during clinical workflow? What does a day in a life of a expert look like when they're working? And then not only that, what are the environmental factors? What are the hospital policies? As we move more and more towards standardization, saying the checklist is, I've heard the other checklist, absolutely important. Um, in some time, checklists are very important to check and correct as, an, as, an, as a thing. Absolutely hard-nosed adherence to checklist is not completely, which means you just don't tolerate any failure. Innovations are made from failures. You'll never have, so you have to understand when people deviate. So if I deviate from something, when do I deviate? 
So one of the works that we are doing right now is deviation from standardized uh, um, uh, trauma protocols. When do people deviate? And when do they deviate? Is it innovation? Is it something new? Or is it really just a mistake that, that they should not be following? So these are the kinds of questions that come up about the failures in the medical system that we have to be very, very careful about as we are moving forward to understand a little bit more instead of just saying, you know, just provide the checklist and it's going to give everything because that is just a static thing. That's not the world is. And in professional education, it's going to be particularly important because we are massively moving towards technology. And as I bridged from cognitive and education psychology uh, to um, biomedical informatics, um, I'm starting to understand that a little bit more and also understanding the limitations of uh, what technology can and cannot do without, and then human, so understanding that experts, um, uh, then it's not that what we're expecting experts to do, that's not what they will do. So that's where we are at in terms of these, and we're continuing to do many studies in terms of decision making in the naturalistic environment, environmental constraints that put on the decisions, uh, expert decisions, as well as innovations and deviations from standardization. And all that tells me that um, we all know from wis our wisdom that failure is the way to learn, but where do we, but we can't afford too many failures in the real world. So our next study, another one that we're just embarking on is a, a together with my very close colleague Trevor Cohen is trying to study um, a, um, a, a virtual world, basically working in the second life, trying to create a simulation so that we can control it a little better and we can have team interaction in the virtual world, train these people to be able to, and control. The idea is just to vary controls each time to see what we learn from that that we can bring it to the real world because real world is fairly messy. Thank you. is willing to take uh, questions, and we have, since we are recording this, we have microphones, and there's one over here and one over there, and I'm going to call on the questioners to make sure we have a microphone in place. So, uh, Deborah, we have a gentleman there who'd like to ask a question, and then we'll take someone, you, there's, a, there's an on switch on the bottom. All right. There we go. And then we'll take one on this side after. Okay. Hi, Dr. Patel. Thank you very much for uh, speaking to us. Uh, going back to the paper-based trial that you did, uh, what I was interested in is, did you get any form of type 1 errors, meaning the doctors were uh, seeing errors that weren't actually there, creating false positives? Was that an issue at all? Um, that was not an issue in this particular one, but other studies we have done, that's absolutely true. And in fact, what happens, I'll tell you where we most often pick it, is um, very early, uh, particularly uh, real experts. Um, so if they have a priori decided what the problem is already, they most likely try and read something that's not there because they try to fit it back. So yes, we found a lot of those errors in very early studies, um, trying to because they're trying to fit the pattern to something that they believe it to be, and that's the the um, error of, of the sort of uh, confirmatory bias they have towards it. Absolutely, very true. We do see it, and uh, in fact, also see it in very uh, students very often because in students what they do is they either try and twist the hypothesis to fit but the facts are already there or they generate new facts they don't know about to fit that. Absolutely, and it's very clear and it's loud and clear in every stage, of every, all of them. So what we really um, comes down to is that to what extent your comprehension or your understanding of the problem relates to your ability to solve the problem. So if you have a, if you already um, make an error during comprehension, which is trying to get the wrong, subsequent things are likely to happen. So very early, as a, understanding as a prerequisite to solving a problem, as a prerequisite to making a decision. Okay. Thank you very much. They're public, by the way, they're all published data. Hi, thank, that was really interesting. Um, I, I just had a question about um, what could be like a tension between the two points that you put up there in the beginning and then that you challenged and then you sort of revised them. So you sort of revised them to say that rather than an individual 
a sort of notion of accountability, it's sort of better to understand things as more being more systemic. Okay, um, and then and then the you know you then you talked about wanting to um, seeing a functional role for re the recognition of errors and. And, uh, and recovery from errors, right. right? So I'm sort of worried that there might be a tension because I can imagine someone saying, okay, responsibility is, or accountability is systemic, right? right. So it's not just me, right? I, it sort of gets spread out over a bunch of other people. Um, and, and if that's the case, then you, you could imagine a physician or, or just anyone who, who commits an error not really recognizing it as their own because they're working with this. Right systemic idea of accountability. Mm -hmm. And then maybe they'd be less likely to, to, learn, to recognize that, you know, that no, really it was them or something sure. like that. So it, it's, um, of course, a bit of a straw man, you know, to some extent. Uh, it's not pure black and white. Uh, you can't say, um, you know, I'm not completely responsible. Person is responsible to some extent. But um, there's a chain of events that happen. And in the, in the system, there is an error check in place. But it just happens that it just sneaks through everything. And, and, and it happens so often. Uh, and therefore, the person, it's not that the person's not completely responsible. Um, it's not a person's completely responsible. Some responsible, the whole blame is not on that person. That's where it is. Uh, most often, we, you know, we fire the person who really was responsible for causing a death of uh, another a patient or something, because, or, or we don't uh, uh, we take some probatory action. Um, we don't say, let's look at what exactly happened here. You know, uh, This is something, being on the other side of the fence, being in the hospitals where I was being on the um, um, quality assurance program to know, to trace back what exactly happened in time. For example, a patient coming in, uh, a real case, a patient coming in where uh, the doctor writes a uh, prescription, writes by hand. Uh, so there's a patient, it's an error by him, of course, by doing it by hand, makes a mistake, the L is taken as one. So instead of saying um, Lamictal 200 milligram, it's Lamictal Lamic 1,200 milligrams. And that has been taken, given to the pharmacy, pharmacy dispenses the medication, nurse gives it to the patient, and the patient dies. Okay, it goes in a trauma. Now, um, there's an error check here. Error check is that that heavy dose never doesn't exist in the pharmacy. So they had to specially order it. it then nobody ever has it. But then he, the pharmacist trusted the doctor because they were busy. It's a higher chain of events. Now who really, and, and then when the medicine came, there was a handful of pills. I mean, nobody gives a handful of pills to a patient. But then a nurse thought that pharmacy knows what it's doing, the doctor knows what it's doing, so the trust come on. Now, who really is responsible here? You know, it's very difficult. Um, so everybody's responsible here. I mean, it's not that you're not responsible. But there's a whole nature of what else happened at that time. Was the pharmacy being, dis pharmacy was being distracted? Uh, was, the res was the attending or the resident who ordered this, uh, was it someone you don't want to challenge? Uh, was it something else? So you really need to know what exactly is going on here. But, but really, just the point is that, that one person at the end of the chain. This happened in another place, another time, not around here. Uh, and, the, and the final chain, last person was fired. You know, that's the point. The point is that you're still responsible. You, your patient was under your care. So it's a, it's a dicey situation, but it's not black and white. It looks like there are actually two different kinds of errors. There are errors that, uh, in hindsight or uh, reflection, are obvious. Okay, and there are errors uh, where you have a complicated medical situation, and a physician is forced to make a decision and makes the wrong one. Uh, the uh, in the in the first case of the inadvertent error. There's not a whole lot, you know, I mean, you just have to, as you say, uh, try to catch mistakes and, and okay. check. In the case of, of a, a wrong decision, uh, this is more like the errors of type one, uh, there are some efforts to help physicians 
do that with, you know, the, uh, there's a, there's a, an, uh, there was a recent conference at the Baker Institute about medical records. Right. And, and this, this, this work at Vanderbilt uh, mm -hmm. to, uh, to help in the, in the errors of the second type. So uh, that's, uh, I guess what I'm trying to get at is, uh, do you ever bring that into your, into your calculations? Do you consider an error in a medical decision, an error or, you know, exactly, as, 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 it's not, there's different categories is what there I'm are. trying to get at. You, you are absolutely right, you're absolutely right. They are of different nature uh, and, um, uh, Decisions uh, calling for judgment call, and the, uh, the you know in literature it's well documented. Various kinds of errors have been identified. Some of them are you can eradicate, you can remove them. They shouldn't happen by a checklist and things. Uh, and I've combined them all together just to make a point. But you're absolutely right. They are different nature. Slips and mistakes can always you can get rid of quickly. It's not a problem at all. When I'm talking about elimination, I'm talking about something quite different in a way. And uh, you are right, and that would happen. An electronic health record is one of the things. Um, since I'm also majorly involved with this, because you know, Office of National Coordinators, when they gave out these four big grants, one of them came to us. So we are looking at this electronic. So the interesting part is very, just while we're talking about that, just wanted to just point one thing. A number of years ago when I wasn't, um, by the way, your point is well taken. Um, a number of years ago when, uh, when we didn't have electronic record anywhere at McGill University in the hospital, um, I started to work with a company. Uh, I, I don't know why, because I'm not really technologically inclined very much, but uh, I said, well, how about, because I had an idea that if you are using paper-based record, keeping it, and if you just put in any technology, it's going to have a lot of impact on your cognition. It's not just a, uh, a piece of something that, a technology that facilitates uh, efficiency or anything. It really changes the way you think and workplace. So I just had an idea, and I most often, most often I just have ideas. So I put that in it, and I got into the diabetic clinic. I took a whole lot of protocols of the, of the handwritten uh, by the doctors of diabetes type 2, and then we put in electronic health record. The similar matching patients we took out there. And then after a year, I took the electronic health record away and gave them to back on paper-based. And I, I was really stunned to what I found. I wasn't expecting that big a difference. And what happened is that it had such a strong impact that they suddenly, everybody started to use paper-based. Uh, paper, when they start, when, when back to paper-based, they were using like electronic record. Actually, because of the structure of it, it was easy to use, you know? And they started to make less mistakes of certain nature. So one thing that happened, it did support certain kind of way of dealing with it, organizing information, manage huge amount of, massive amount of information in a, in a kind of way that it could easily access. So the retrieval and access was wonderful. So that was a great thing. The downside was that, um, so this is nobody looks at usually because this is not something you do because you're always looking for what it, good it can do. So the upside was that you it quickly able to summarize, manage, make a decision fast. Downside was that these systems, these support systems, this so-called decision support system guide you, help you, support you. So certain filters come up. Given the notion of the patient, do you want um, diabetic filter, do you want endocrinology, do you want cardiology, do you want nephrology guides you? So if you're on the wrong track up front, you're up the garden path. So what it happens is that if you're the wrong way, you completely narrow down very early. And not only that, your directionality of reasoning changes now. You are d doing data-driven reasoning, and suddenly you're doing hypothesis-driven. It's quite the opposite. And so there's an error check, bottom up. So when you have a lot of information to process, the way to check errors. There's no way to check errors coming down. You know, so this is a kind of, uh, uh, it wasn't so trivial because as time went on, it became very more important. Uh, so there are little things like that. So yes, there are many kinds of errors, so that support and lots of them. So you have to look for some of those subtle ones and things that are likely to happen that might catch in that we don't know unless we really study them, you know? Uh, hey, Dr. Patel, how are you doing? First of all, I want to say thank you so much for the presentation. You're most welcome. Very lovely. 
Uh, I was wondering, one of the things I was kind of concerned about, I was wondering maybe if you had um, kind of taken this into account into the research that you did. What I can see is a lot of it is in the ICU and in the ER and very stressful, very dynamic situations. And I, I believe, you know, checklists, error checks, all of those things work great in the clinic, primary care, all of those areas in, in the OR, you have like your timeouts. When you're out in the ambulance, when you're in the ER, you have a patient coming in and in like five minutes you decide, Maybe quite close in to about you. five minutes you decide, you know, what am I going to do, how am I going to go about this? And in, a se in essence, there's a certain degree of fate. I mean, you have a patient come into the ER, they've lost 35% of their blood, now they're in hypovolemic shock, and what are you going to do after that? No checklist is going to substitute for that. Mm. At a certain point, you're going to have to do the best you can, and when a patient fails, right. God forbid a patient right. dies in that scenario, right. who do they blame? Like, who right. do you look at in that situation? Well, see, this is, this is the thing. Um, you know, you all, people say, you work under uncertainty, let's get, up, get rid of uncertainties. You can't get rid of uncertainties. That's what you're talking about. And that's, that's always there. So you have to study in the uncertain environment what are the nature of decisions you make. And incomplete information, no patient arriving in here has a complete information. Uncertain environment, incomplete information. And, and uh, uh, so again, it's the system dynamics again. So what we're doing right now, studying, or we, right, not right now, I've been doing it for the last three years now, is to tag. So we put a tag, and, and, a, and a tag is a, a radio identifier on, on people. They carry it for 10 hour period. And then we have base stations, you know, where they all, everything you say record is all dumped there, and your movement is dumped. So if, you, if I move closer to you 10 times, that will record my movement to you and your movement to mine. And we want to know who's moving towards what, and then a whole period of time. And then, we have to collect a lot of data because then we want to know when a mistake occurs. Then we want to map onto that level to say what happened at that moment in time when that mistake happened. You know, so who, what really happened there? And the, the downside is that we have to have a huge lot of data before, because that doesn't happen that often. You really look at it. But so this is the question: is not who made the mistake, but what happened at that? But what? what pushed you to make that mistake? What pushed you to the boundary? Maybe you followed a, a, a protocol, hospital protocol, which you followed because you'd be liable if you don't. And, but it wasn't really a good thing to follow in this case, given the nature of the patient. It was a deviation. So we want to know what happened. So to decide who, to how to make something that is such an implicit decision much more explicit. You know, because right now you, you suddenly do things. You have a checklist, everything. How often do you look at checklists? Not very often. It's up on the wall. We keep it there because once you look at it, you don't have time to look at it on the go. So this is the question is that how should we train them? What should we do? I think that's what we're talking about. So if we do more of these studies and, and then not only do qualitative study, quantify it, making sure, do enough validation, uh, make sure we have some good numbers behind us because uh, bureaucracy always understands numbers. You don't want to give a whole lot of qualitative data. And make sure they're statistically reliable to give it to, you know, working with number of deans for a number of years to sort of figure it out very early and able to give them to do. And I think that's what's needed because everybody will blame somebody else, you know? It wasn't, I didn't do it, somebody else did. And nobody is really to be blamed. It's just the nature of the task you do. You're asked to do impossible tasks, and then you can't expect it to function. And, and we work under suboptimal conditions. We are not, you know, optimal thinkers. We satisfy. We do the best at that moment in time. But maybe that moment wasn't, didn't provide the best environment support. Thank you. All right, uh, I hope you'll forgive me if I uh, cut off the questions now because we do have a reception waiting outside. So I just want to thank Dr. Patel for taking the time to come and give us this wonderful talk that gave us such rich insights into how complex and dynamic decision making is when viewed through this cognitive science lens. And I want to thank you all for coming and invite you to our next lecture, which will be on election day. And Rice's Dan Wallach will be talking about adventures in election, uh, in 
voting machine failure. You'll want to hear that, particularly in light of the destruction of all of Harris County's voting machines in a fire not too long ago. So uh, thank you all very much, and please join us outside for the reception. Thank you. This program is protected by a copyright and may not be redistributed in whole or in part without the express written consent of Rice Digital Media Services.